Hi, and welcome to General Chemistry 2. So lots of great content to cover in this course, and we start right out with our first learning unit here on intermolecular forces and thinking about phase changes between solids, liquids, and gases. So we're gonna build on some things that we've learned before and also uh, set the foundations for some things that we're gonna move on to in uh, our next few learning units. So our first skill here is on heating and cooling curves. This video is gonna be one of the longer ones for this learning unit because this is the skill that you will be tested on on an in-class quiz. So a little bit of background, reviewing some concepts from uh, Gen Chem 1. When we think about the difference between chemical and physical properties, we can think about chemical properties of water uh, being the same, whether it's a solid, liquid, or a gas. And so those chemical properties have to do with, with bonding and things like that. Physical properties depend on their physical state and thus are different. So water is still going to be H2O, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, but physical properties are going to be different. Whether it is a solid, a liquid, or a gas uh, depends, that's a physical property depending on melting point, boiling point, and so forth. So kind of building on that and thinking about the difference between intra and intermolecular forces is key to this learning unit. So intra, as the prefix implies, has to do with forces that are within a molecule. These are things that give rise to its molecular shape, bond energies, aspects of chemical behavior. And again, for water, those are going to be the same, whether it's solid, liquid, or gaseous water. This learning unit is focused on intermolecular forces. We call these non-bonding interactions, or IMFs for short, for intermolecular forces. These are forces, as the interprefix uh, implies, between molecules. So these are going to be things that influence physical properties of molecular liquids and solids. So again, when we think about the states of matter, we've talked about these already. Uh, unit five that we had from Gen Chem 1 dealt with gases. And so when we think about solids, liquids, and gases, the fundamental difference as to whether a substance is a solid, liquid, or a gas has to do with the distance between particles. Okay. Now, temperature and pressure can affect those distances, but ultimately something is a solid, liquid, or a gas depending on how we have di uh, distances between particles. And those distances are affected by two main things. We can think of the first one as being potential energy. So this is these intermolecular forces that we're talking about, these attractive forces. I want you to think about it like molecular Velcro. This potential energy, this molecular Velcro, tends to hold matter together. Okay, so that's going to decrease the distance. Okay. Opposing that force is kinetic energy. So this is where aspects of temperature and motion come into play. So the energy of molecules, this kinetic energy, is what allows matter to disperse, increase distance. And so, so the interplay between these two forces, those intermolecular forces wanting to hold particles together, and then the kinetic energy of particles wanting to move them further apart. The interplay between these is going to determine whether something is a solid, liquid, or gas, the phase that that matter is in. So just a couple of examples. You will have quiz questions that kind of address a lot of this qualitative stuff. If we want to think about a gas, a gas has particles that have so much kinetic energy that it greatly overcomes the intermolecular forces. Molecules are moving very rapidly. They're very distant from one another, and that's because they have a lot of kinetic energy. That's generally because we have a higher temperature. So again, that's how temperature comes into play. Liquids, we kind of have this uh, interplay between kinetic energy and these intermolecular forces that allow the intermolecular forces to be larger because these molecules are going to stick together, but they have enough kinetic energy that they're kind of rolling around on one another, right? Still in close proximity together, but there's a lot of molecular motion in a liquid. Contrast that to a solid. In this case, those intermolecular forces are going to be so much greater than the kinetic energy that these individual particles have, so they sit still. They're very close to one another. They're very ordered. They're not moving around a lot. And again, these molecules, you can think of them as being locked into place. 
So how does heat affect this? And this leads into what we're going to be thinking about with this key skill for this learning unit, which is thinking about heating and cooling curves. So I want you to know that when you add heat to a system that provides energy that does one of two things to molecules, the first thing that you can do is you can increase the temperature of the surroundings. And if you increase the temperature of the surroundings, you increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, but you're not going to change the phase. So for example, you could have water that's 40 degrees Celsius. As you heat that, you don't change it to a different phase. It's still going to be liquid water, but now it's liquid water at 50 degrees Celsius. Okay. So in that case, the heat that's being added is adding kinetic energy to these molecules and you're increasing the temperature of that phase. Now, when that water gets to be 100 degrees after you've added heat, all of a sudden now that heat is going to be doing something different. Now the heat will actually disrupt intermolecular interactions and allow for a phase change. So again, heat can do one of two things. It can change the, ch change the temperature of a phase or it can change the phase, but we're not going to be doing both at the same time. So again, when we uh, want to think about if I have some ice that's at zero degrees, as long as I still have some ice in that liquid water, I know exactly what the temperature of that liquid is. It's going to be zero degrees because any heat that's being added is used to disrupt the intermolecular forces and do a phase change from solid water to liquid water. Okay, that's a really important concept. You're only doing one thing at a time with heat. You're either changing the temperature of the same phase or you're staying at the same temperature and you're changing the phase. And those two temperatures are going to be the melting point and then the boiling point. So we can think about this, and we're going to do this both qualitatively and quantitatively. You can think about this with what we call a heating and cooling curve. We're going to see lots of curves and plots and graphs in this uh, section of Gen Chem. So we want to make sure we understand the first thing you want to do when you look at a plot is you look at the axes. So this plots temperature as a function of heat added. So whatever we plot on the y-axis, we say is the measured variable. So what we're doing is we're measuring the temperature of a substance as we manipulate, and the manipulated variable is on the x-axis, we manipulate and add heat. So it makes sense, as we add heat to a substance, we are going to increase its temperature. So generally this curve increases as we go from left to right, but it's not a straight line. We've got increasing parts and we've got flat parts. So these flat lines represent adding heat. So we can see that we're adding heat, right? We've added and moved along our x-axis here, but we haven't moved along the y-axis, which means we're not changing temperature. Remember, this is what happens when we have a phase change. So when you add heat, but you don't change temperature, that heat is being used to change the phase. So again, this represents melting. This is going to represent boiling. These sloped lines represent when we're adding heat and we're changing the temperature of the same phase. So this is again changing the temperature of solid, of ice. This is changing the temperature of liquid water. And this is changing the temperature of water vapor. So these are what we call heating and cooling curves. So you're going to need to think about some aspects of these from a qualitative standpoint for your quiz and importantly for your um, in-person quiz, you're actually going to have to do some calculations. We can actually calculate how much heat we have to add to do any of these transitions. Okay, so every day as we go through the four skills in this learning unit, we're going to continue to practice these problems because it's important that you be comfortable with this so that you're ready for our quiz. I'm just going to go through this part really briefly because we're going to have time to practice in class. But when we have these problems, I'm going to give you an application of something and I'm just going to say, how much heat do we need to add? Or if I add this much heat, how much of, of, of this process can I do? What we really need to do is we need to figure out on this heating and cooling curve, how many legs, how many sections am I going through? Each one of these lines represents a different calculation that we need to do that we then need to add up. We've seen things like this before where we added, had little pieces of calculations and then we needed to add them up for a total. So this is going to be the first example here of this. So when we're changing the phase but staying at the same temperature, these are our flat lines, here's sort of the steps that we need to do. 
Okay, I'm not going to go through the details of this. We'll practice this in class, but there's a certain equation or calculation that we're going to have to do. We need to make sure that we're going to be using moles and not grams. We, need, uh, we don't need to use or think about a temperature for this, and we'll get an answer that's in kilojoules. If we're on one of those vertical spots, we're changing the temperature of a substance that's in the same phase. Hopefully this equation looks familiar. When we had our unit six in Gen Chem 1, this was our calorimetry equation. To figure out the heat, we're gonna be changing a certain mass of substance, a certain amount of temperature, and there's a specific heat capacity for that. So hopefully that'll be a familiar calculation, and we need to make sure we're using grams of substances, not moles, and we need to make sure we use the right heat capacity. Okay, temperature changes, remember if it's Kelvin or degrees Celsius, if we're looking at a difference, we don't need to worry about Kelvin or Celsius, right? Um, and the answer for this is going to be in joules. So when we add these up together, we need to make sure we keep units. So that's why we're gonna practice these problems a lot over the next few lecture periods to make sure that you're really comfortable in preparation for your quiz. So again, we'll practice this in class. How do you set up these problems? You have to determine what portion of the curve you're on. It might just be one line. It might be more than one line. You need to figure out what parts am I adding up. And you also have to figure out, am I heating or am I cooling? Q is going to be positive if I'm adding heat in. It's going to be negative if I'm removing heat. Okay. Then you need to determine, um, again, if you're doing a vertical change, we're doing a heat capacity type calculation. If we're doing a horizontal change, we're going to need to use enthalpy values, and we'll go through how to do that in class. And then you're going to sum up everything at the end. So we're going to practice lots of these problems because we have to make sure we get all of these pieces right. But at the end, you're going to be excellent at doing heating and cooling curve calculations.